The goal is to, to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Okay, so then what do you do? Well, then, then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with the schedule? It's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. Well, it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And obviously, there's a bit of responsibility that's going to go along with that. Because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're going to insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than you were that, than at the beginning of the day, right? Because that's a stupid day. If you have a bunch of those in a row, you just dig, you know, you dig yourself a hole and then you bury yourself in it. It's like, sorry, that's just not a good strategy. It's a bad strategy. So maybe 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the damn things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that, just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you got to work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you going to do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that, you know. So maybe you do an hour of, of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. You know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy. But that beats the hell out of zero. Right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week. Or 50.5% for God's sake. Or, because you're, you're going to hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. And so, so that's one way that you can work on your conscientiousness, is plan a life you'd like to have. And, and you do that partly by referring to social norms. That's more or less rescuing your father from the belly of the whale. But the way, other way you do that is by having a little conversation with yourself about as if you don't really know who you are, because you know what you're like. You won't do what you're told. You won't do what you tell yourself to do. You must have noticed that. It's like you're a bad employee and a worse boss. And, and both of those work, you know, for you. You don't know what you want to do. And then when you tell yourself what to do, you don't do it anyway. So you should fire yourself and find someone else to be. But, but you know, my point is, is that you have to understand that you're not your own servant, so to speak. You're someone that you have to negotiate with. And that's, and you, you're someone that you want to present the opportunity of having a good life to. And that's hard for people because they don't like themselves very much. So, you know, they're always like cracking the whip and then procrastinating and cracking the whip and then procrastinating. And it's like, God, it's so boring and it's such a pathetic way of spending your time. And you know what that's like because you probably waste like six hours a day. And I think we did an economic calculation about that a while back, right? Your time's probably worth 50 bucks an hour, something like that. I mean, you're not getting paid that now, but you're young. And so this is investment time. And what you do now is going to multiply its effects in the future. So... So let's say it's 50 bucks an hour, which is perfectly reasonable. So if you waste six hours a day, and you are, then you're wasting about $2,000 a week or about $100,000 a year. So like, go ahead, but that's what it's costing you every hour. And you need to know what your damn time is worth. So let's say it's not 50 bucks, it's 30, whatever. Maybe it's 100, it's somewhere in that range. One of the things you should be asking yourself is, when you spend an hour, was that, well, what if I paid someone 50 bucks to have had that hour? And if the answer is no, it's like, well, maybe you should do something else with your time. And it depends on whether or not you think that your time's worthwhile. But the funny thing about not assuming that is if you assume your time isn't worthwhile, what happens is you don't just sit around sort of randomly in a state of responsibility-less bliss. 
what you do is you suffer existentially. And so that seems like a stupid solution. So, okay, so anyways, as far as I can tell, that's how you can improve your conscientiousness. Hit a, you know, outline a goal that you actually would like to hit. And even better, here's something else you can think about when you're negotiating in your life. You could say, if you're kind of pessimistic, you'd say, well, we have to negotiate an agreement. I'd like to walk away not miserable and resentful. Okay, let's call that a baseline. And that's how you're going to negotiate with your wife or your husband. That's a good thing to know. You want to negotiate so that you don't walk away miserable and resentful because that makes you hostile and then you'll work to hurt them. And I would say that's unless you want to hurt them and then of course they'll happily return the favor. Unless you, if you want to exist in a place where you're basically hitting each other in the head repeatedly for 30 years, you go right ahead. But I wouldn't say that that's a particularly good way of living. So you might say, well the minimal precondition for a successful negotiation is that you don't walk away resentful and angry. And so that's also how you know when you have something to say to someone. Because the rule has to be, if you're going to walk away resentful and angry, you've got something to say. It doesn't mean you're right, by the way. But it does mean that you have something to say. But it's kind of a low bar, you know. Like, if I wanted to live with you for 30 years, maybe we should say, how about we walk away from our mutual negotiations thrilled? Well, why not? You know, you've got to aim for something. You could aim for that. You want to negotiate with your boss for a new salary. You might think, okay, I've got this damn job. How much would I have to be paid so I'd be so bloody excited to go to work I could hardly stand it? Well, you could at least know what that number is. And then you could go there and say, well, look, you know, you like to have me around. I've been doing some thinking. I think if you paid me this amount of money, I'd be so thrilled to go to work that you could hardly even keep me away from here. And your boss might think, well, I'd actually really like to have someone around who'd be so thrilled to work that I can't get rid of them. It's like, maybe I'll, well, I can't give you all of that. I'll give you 75%. Maybe we can renegotiate it in a year. It's like, hey, good deal. Or you can, you know, be some weaselly coward and go in there and snivel about how awful your life is and walk away barely able to tolerate the outcome of the negotiation. It's like, I wouldn't recommend that. And it's funny because I've watched people do this repeatedly in my clinical practice because I do, we do, we plan all the time because the rule is you're going to come and see me. I'm going to try to help you figure out how to have the life that you want to have. And we're going to think about that strategically. And so you're making $50,000 a year right now. Maybe you should be making $150,000 in three years. And they think, well, uh, that couldn't happen. It's like, not with that attitude, that's the first thing. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. If you, if you don't ask people for the damn money, if you don't look for a better job, but they're going to come along and just shovel a boat full of money at you. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. But it, why is that impossible? Look at you, you people in here. It's like, what the hell is wrong with you? Nothing. So you can probably have what you want. If you could figure out what the hell it was, and then, you know, you diligently pursued it, so, and then maybe you wouldn't whine about being alive. That'd be good because people who whine about being alive are dangerous to themselves and other people. So you might think, I can have what I want, but you better well figure out what it is. And you can't just wait for the, like, have what you want fairy to show up at your doorstep and grant it, because obviously that's not going to happen. So, so okay, conscientiousness. Well, we talked about how you could improve that. Social networking, that's another big deal. It's one of the advantages that older people have over younger people. And so, for example, now that I'm in my 50s, roughly speaking, I know a bunch of other people who are, you know, relatively well positioned in the dominance hierarchy, and they know all sorts of people. And so when I go to one of them and say, you know, can you do X or do you know X? They say, no, but I know someone who can. And that's a huge advantage. So another thing that you want to think about as you move through life, and, and, and this is, is that use your ability to network properly and th that doesn't mean schmooze and it doesn't mean go out and impress people that's all just complete bloody rubbish it means you 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 try to surround yourself with people who are competent in multiple different dimensions and you maintain your relationships with them and that's a trading relationship too right it, it, it involves recipro reciprocity but it's a huge advantage a social network is a huge advantage and that's something extroverted people can be really good at because you know they have the, that sort of social ability and that goes along with the ability to sell. So another place that you can pick up power and power for the good, for the right things is to, is to consciously develop and maintain your social networks. And that also means, well, let's talk about friendships for a minute. Here's how you know if someone's your friend. 
A. You can tell them bad news and they'll listen. They won't tell you why, you know, you're stupid and, and why that bad thing happened to you and how something worse happened to them once and, you know, derail the whole conversation. You can actually tell them bad news and they'll listen. So that's a good thing. And then this is a weirder thing. You can tell them good news and they'll help you celebrate. 